All right, everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining us for our advanced cloud pen testing scenarios webinar. Um, just as a heads up, this webinar is going to be recorded and we will have the replay available to you on our YouTube channel as well as on trustedsec.com. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, feel free to ask them during or using the Q&A function uh, within Zoom, and then we'll take care of all of those at the end of the webinar. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand everything over to Paul Berklin. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about advanced cloud pen test scenarios. Now, this isn't going to be a super technical talk, but hopefully you'll find it useful. And the advice should be pretty vendor agnostic, so you should be able to do this anywhere, really. So with that, some quick introductions. Uh, joining myself today are Edwin David and Patrick Mayo. We're part of the Cloud Force team. We do our the pen testing uh, here at TrustedSec for cloud assets. Uh, if you both want to just introduce yourself real quick. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Edwin David. I'm a security consultant uh, here at TrustedSec's uh, uh, Cloud Force team. Uh, so I primarily do all the uh, Azure penetration testing for TrustedSec. Hey everyone, I'm Patrick Mayo. I also work with TrustedSec and I mainly focus on the AWS testing for clients. Awesome, and uh, I'm Paul Berkland. I'm the practice lead here. So uh, I do a little bit of everything uh, in the cloud. Now, we do have a couple of previous webinars. So if you are looking for some more content around this, uh, please check those out. There will be links provided uh, in the chat. Uh, Penetration testing your cloud environment is kind of a rudimentary uh, intro going over some of the basics and what you might uh, find during a cloud pen test. And then insecure by default was uh, another one that we did that focused on the insecure defaults that are, are common in, in cloud uh, environments. So both of those are well worth watching if you have not seen them yet. So let's talk a little bit about cloud testing. What is cloud testing, right? It's a, it's a little bit of an amorphous subject, <laughs> no pun intended that it doesn't fall exactly in the same bounds as traditional pen testing. So traditional pen testing, right, is focused on network-based uh, findings, really. You're looking for open uh, ports, trying to identify services running on those ports, maybe finding vulnerable services running on there. Maybe you're, uh, you know, dealing with web applications. But at any rate, it's all focused around uh, the network layer testing there. Uh, cloud testing, there's, there's a little bit more to it because uh, there's a variety of service types offered and then there are a variety of services within those service types, right? So uh, it's if you were to approach cloud pen testing with only network layer testing, you're gonna be missing out on a lot of the opportunity uh, that attackers might take advantage of to uh, move laterally or privesque, et cetera, just because you wouldn't be seeing those uh, because of the interfaces that they're hidden behind. Now, when we do our standard cloud pen test, we'll often start out from an unauthenticated vantage point, right? We're trying to really test that external perimeter, see what we can find, what users we can identify, password spray, et cetera. Uh, from there, we would move into an authenticated testing uh, model where we would use a valid user credential, either discovered or provided, but we test out things like conditional access, making sure that those authentication controls are in place, and then looking to see what normal users might have access to were they to gain, ac or, uh, gain access to the cloud environment. Oftentimes, uh, SharePoint might be littered with secrets uh, that, that shouldn't be in there, et cetera. Uh, then the third uh, method of testing is going to be taking that higher level look, right? Going up to the very high level using security reader or similar, and you're going to identify misconfigurations and then other attack paths that might exist throughout the environment. Uh, so some examples here of things that we might find or might do. Uh, Patrick, if you'd like to walk through a few of these, uh, just explaining what they are. Yeah, so for these ones in a part of the typical AWS web test or AWS cloud test is that we'll look through metadata storage files that are held in S3 or maybe have been publicly committed to GitHub or GitLab, Bamboo, what have you, and kind of see if there's any credentials of any means that we can leverage in order to get into the act, get into the environment or gain additional access into to different areas and resources in the, in the environment. Password spraying, we kind of do similar, so we can see if we can get access into an account, either through a configured identity provider, 
uh, like Microsoft into AWS um, or others that we have permission to. Um, with privilege escalation, we're typically try to see what access we do have and use different tools like PMapper or, or individually reviewing policies and seeing where we can get access to or leverage different services that have access to those roles to get to different um, levels of permissions. And kind of data exfiltration is just pulling data out of the environment, seeing if sensitive or customer data or proprietary information can be exported out in different ways that customers may not be looking at. Um, and kind of for the code and configuration poisoning, we'll kind of see where code's being leveraged, how the data pipelines and workflows are being set up and everything. And if we have access to those to maybe plant a reverse connection or a shell of some kind and use that to pivot further into the environment. Thank you. So Azure's similar, uh, we're similar style uh, where we also will uh, identify weak passwords and uh, I'm gonna hand this over to Edwin actually to, to walk through a little bit. Yep. Hey, thank you. Um, so yeah, these are some of the typical issues that uh, we'll look to find uh, during a, a standard Azure penetration test. So um, uh, we definitely look for weak passwords, uh, just season, months, years, uh, uh, the, the typical low hanging fruit, uh, and to see if we can get some initial access in there. Uh, uh, MFA just kind of varies um, if somebody is using something like Authenticator. Uh, number matching is pretty prevalent with um, uh, with that application, but there still are a number of uh, third-party apps that have not migrated away from push notifications. So we'll attempt to uh, uh, coerce users into uh, accepting those types of notifications if we land on a weak password. Um, and then on, on top of that, uh, with initial access, uh, we look at uh, gaps in conditional access um, that may de be dependent upon uh, workloads. Uh, maybe graph isn't secured uh, with MFA. Um, there's several tool sets that we'll use to evaluate um, and see if we can get around uh, conditional access. Uh, uh, mobile agents is another thing that uh, we'll, we'll utilize in our tool belt. Uh, if we can't get in under the uh, uh, normal user agents like Windows 10, Linux, that sort of thing. Um, once we are in, um, uh, we do look at uh, uh, application registrations since that is a point of persistence uh, inside the uh, Azure Cloud environment. So we'll, uh, we'll attempt to do that. Uh, if there's like a social engineering component uh, attached to the engagement, then we'll attempt to, to get users to try and uh, consent to that application that we register uh, from within the tenant. Um, uh, the next one, uh, SharePoint Online is just really kind of a biggie. Um, it can be littered with uh, passwords and secrets. It doesn't necessarily have to be in like Excel spreadsheets or OneNotes. Um, I, I've seen other things like uh, memory dumps uh, being stored in SharePoint Online uh, and that sort of thing, uh, YAML files, uh, just some of the non-typical um, uh, extensions uh, aside from the normal uh, Office applications. Um, and then uh, typically on, on Azure Blobs, um, usually we'll have a client either give us the storage account names or we'll enumerate them with like kind of assumed access because um, they, they can really kind of be named anything. And then uh, we use tools like Microburst to uh, attempt to uh, uh, dump those storage blobs. And then uh, we also uh, have like several like IEM misconfigurations uh, that can be looked at too, uh, just to kind of give a, a small example. Um, yeah. uh, if there's like a, a if there's a, a group or an individual account that has like subscription ownership or contributor access, uh, that type of stuff. Uh, if there's some overlap in uh, grouping, um, we'll we'll capitalize on that as well. Awesome, thanks, Edwin. <laughs> and yeah, so these are just kind of uh, some examples of things that we might find during during a cloud pen test in either of these areas. Uh, the AWS and Azure sides differ a little bit in that the AWS side has generally less users interacting with it daily. Azure, of course, because it's popular for identity management, uh, is it often has a lot of users uh, touching it, so to speak. Uh, GCP also, uh, so GCP also has uh, flaws in it, just like any other cloud environment. Um, so kind of 
more in line though with with the the AWS findings, I would I would say, uh, as far as what is typically found uh, on an engagement there. Now, there are some common cloud failings that we see a lot of the times just across the board, right? Uh, people, the biggest one I think is lift and shift where they just take existing code and they move it over into the cloud, but they don't think about how they can leverage some of the new features in the cloud to make that more secure. Uh, instead of, you know, like saving plain text credentials in scripts, uh, they may be able to uh, store them securely instead and they should. Uh, access control is still an issue and overly permissive IAM uh, roles. And then of course we have insecure defaults there. These are all common things that we see uh, a lot on, on these engagements. So let's say you've gone through and you've done your pen testing, uh, you've done your config reviews, right? Everything's all in order. Uh, so not, now what do you do? What, what do you do once you've, you've aced your, your pen testing report? Well, we've traditionally looked at testing of individual components, right? So we will do an internal pen test that focuses on the internal assets, usually as you know, you're trying to get domain controller access. You might do a gray box that focuses on one application. Uh, Cloud pen test, you know, obviously it focuses on the cloud environment, or you might do social engineering where you're just trying to uh, kind of, you know, either fish or vish or uh, get somebody with an instant message fish as well. Uh, the problem is though that in the cloud, everything is connected, right? It's it's not in it's not in an oasis on its own. Uh, there's a lot of connections from various aspects or uh, along various aspects of this. Uh, so I mean, first of all, VPN. There's a lot of times you'll have a VPN site to site uh, between your on-premises and and uh, the cloud environments for easy access. So that, that's one connection point here. You'll often have IAM synced, right? If you're using Azure and you're doing a hybrid setup where you're syncing uh, from on-prem into uh, Entra ID, uh, then obviously you have a connection there. And uh, this, this often comes up, right? Because uh, we'll, we'll see this rear its ugly head in the sense that uh, bad passwords get synced into Azure sometimes from on-prem. And so you say, oh, hey, how did I get password, uh, you know, a weak password like password? Uh, and it's it's because it was it was synced insecurely. Uh, so yeah, definitely a place that where you see that it's connected, uh, where the cloud is connected to your on-prem. So it's not just one individual environment. Uh, infrastructure, we, we will find domain controllers in AWS, domain controllers in Azure, uh, Exchange in AWS, you know, that type of thing where you have... Uh, infrastructure components from your organization located in the cloud. So here, here you have another a mishmash of sorts uh, where you have on-premises possibly or quote unquote on-premises uh, in, in the cloud. You also have cross-cloud connections, right? You might be storing your backups in another cloud solution or you might be using IAM in AWS uh, via Azure Entra ID. Uh, so you, you might be crisscrossing your cloud services as well. So. Here again, one if you're testing one cloud environment, you may be missing things that that uh, where they're connected, uh, or in the gray area between the connections. And then, of course, there's the users. This is the real backbone, right? That that cements it all together. Is the, those same users often will have access to multiple environments, right? So, uh, you know, sysadmins on the on-premises are going to have access into both of the AWS and Azure and GCP environments if they have them. Uh, and so a compromised user might have connections to multiple environments here. So they're not they're not in a silo. Uh, if you know if somebody gets fished and and there's uh, a, an attacker on their box, uh, they're not going to say, well, you know, clouds out of scope on this assessment. So I'm just going to stay on the on-prem uh, hosts. So for this reason, it, it's important to kind of look at some different approaches to testing. And for the first one I want to talk about here is is hybrid testing. Uh, or multi-component testing. Now, this is useful because, as I was saying, the you know attackers don't exist in a silo. They they can move between your scopes that that are declared during the security tests. Uh, so this can might bring to light some issues that may not have been apparent to you before. You know, maybe it's some logging issues you have. Maybe it's a security boundary where there's not a a real delineation as to who has. Uh, the the responsibility for for that particular area, um, so testing between two different environments can kind of help figure out where you might have a blind spot, where you might not have noticed something, or you might have uh, some some protocols that need to be put into place as far as how to handle things there, or who who has responsibility for different areas. So in the past, we we found some good findings by combining testing. 
Uh, and some some examples here uh, are listed. Uh, Edwin uh, and or Patrick, if you'd want to chime in at any point here on, on these, I know you have some firsthand experience with uh, some of these accounts here. Um, yeah, so just just going over like uh, uh, the first one, uh, finding plain text credentials or tokens from browsers. Um, you know that that's more of a um, uh, system compromise uh, where where you know maybe a payload has been dropped uh, onto a user device and um, tokens have been uh, stolen. Um, I know we do have a public buff for that sort of thing. There are other tooling out there where. Um, uh, you can dump processes like Excel and Word and get tokens uh, and credentials that way. Um, <clears throat> another thing that um, uh, that we can that we can see quite a bit is, is if hybrid testing is uh, uh, occurring and full domain wide compromise is achieved, um, depending on somebody's Azure AD Connect um, uh, environment settings. Uh, there's this little setting called uh, seamless SSO. Uh, we see it off and on uh, in pen tests, um, depending on uh, what the scope of our work is to. Uh, and if for some reason, if domain-wide compromise is achieved, there's a machine uh, that is roughly inert inside of uh, Active Directory uh, where you can pull the machine hash down and um, you can start using Cloud Kerberos to uh, impersonate uh, some cloud sync users. And so some of the examples that, that we can do there, uh, or at least I would go after anyway, is uh, uh, service accounts. Um, uh, if a service account is synced from on-prem to the cloud, uh, uh, chances are likely very high that they are not secured with MFA. And um, they may hold some elevated privilege roles that, um, uh, uh, that are of value uh, during a, a pen test to do that privilege escalation. Um, so I, I can hand it over to, to Patrick if he has uh, any other comments to kind of make on this slide. Yeah, the one that we've seen plenty is the compromising of the entire build workflow pro process. And this could include the uh, the code repositories, the Git, Bamboo, wherever the code might be sitting internally or even externally in GitHub and part of a private organization if we get access keys of that. And those are tied into runners that go into the build process, which could leak credentials through the logging for those runners, or maybe just in, we can inject uh, additional code into what's being committed and built, which gives us access into the cloud environment by exfiltrating out those AWS keys. And that can provide a way in um, from either internal on-prem stuff or leading to public services that can go into your private cloud environment. And kind of similar with the IDP testing for mobile and web app testing, like with AWS, AWS Cognito, you can, if they're baked, if the right details are all baked in the code for the web app or mobile app, then you can pull out the client ID and do the whole attack method that way. And potentially, if it's an identity pull, gain access keys to go into the environment which could be outside of the initial scope of, or outside scope of the web app or the mobile, but may lead into the AWS as well. Thank you. So yeah, we, we found this very successful in the past at identifying things that had not been uncovered in, in past tests. Now, I wanna show a couple of scenarios here as far as hybrid testing goes uh, th that can be particularly fruitful. So the first one, Social engineering plus a cloud pen test together, aka the barbarians at the gates. Uh, it's it's uh, ensuring that your external controls are effective, right? This is going to be targeting your users externally. This is going to be uh, enumerating users, password spraying, using things like Microsoft Direct Send uh, to spoof emails, see if we can get them to land in your mailbox. Uh, performing team phishing, they've been getting better at uh, blocking external uh, users from messaging directly with Teams, but there's still bypasses that are being found and, and shared. Uh, and then there's token theft as well. Now, uh, I'm going to hand this over actually to Edwin because he's done a bit of this uh, with the token theft and phishing, and, and I just wanted to give him an opportunity to speak a little bit on that and uh, how, how it can be beneficial here to combine the two areas. Yeah, so it, as opposed to weak password spraying where you land on some initial access with, with a valid account, um, uh, phishing and token theft really, really go hand in hand. Um, 
Uh, there's separate tooling that you can use for uh, phishing. Uh, two of the popular ones are uh, Evil Jinx, um, where, where you send out a lure to the uh, end user in hopes that they click on it. It acts as kind of like a reverse proxy. Everything looks normal. The web logon looks normal. It looks like a legitimate uh, Microsoft page. They're putting in their credentials. Um, and in that uh, particular instance, depending on how your um, uh, fishlet is configured, uh, you'll get a session cookie back uh, with an enriched uh, MFA claim. So everything is really kind of bypassed from that standpoint. Um, token theft, um, uh, one of probably my favorite tools is uh, Token Tactics. Um, and with Token Tactics, you basically do device code phishing. Uh, that's a, it's a little device code that you can uh, send to an end user. Uh, it has a 15 minute uh, um, uh, time to live <clears throat> once you generate that code. Uh, but there are other options where you can do uh, like dynamic device code phishing and so forth. And um, what I really kind of like about that tactic is um, everything is completely legitimate that you're sending to the end user. It's a legitimate service. There's nothing malicious about the email. And chances are pretty high that it'll land up in the uh, inbox of your targeted user. Uh, sometimes what we'll do is um, <clears throat> uh, if... Uh, uh, if the default setting for like something like Microsoft Teams is still enabled on the tenant, um, then we can type in the targeted user. We can see when they're uh, either at their desk or when they're away. Um, so that makes the opportunity more rich uh, on when you want to send out that email uh, uh, to try and get that initial token theft going. Uh, direct send is just a, kind of another option. Uh, that was a Microsoft service that was designed for like multifunction printers and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so you can get in there and, and uh, uh, spoof um, uh, an account or user and, and mimic uh, and make it look like uh, the, the user is uh, coming from the inside. Um, I, I mentioned before uh, uh, Microsoft Teams with external presence. Um, obviously, if external presence is allowed where somebody from a completely separate uh, Azure ten tenant um, is allowed to talk to one of your users, um, you can send a message to Microsoft Teams and uh, uh, do phishing that way. Uh, it's a little bit more unconventional because we uh, obviously uh, a lot of people, I think, train their uh, end user base to look at uh, phishing via email. Uh, versus uh, something that may be malicious in nature being sent through Microsoft Teams. Uh, so that's absolutely another vector uh, that, that we'll attempt to do. Um, and then uh, uh, obviously the bottom one is just malicious OAuth app phishing, which is um, where we have some type of initial access into the cloud uh, and we'll register uh, an application uh, so that we can have some persistent access to some users that may click on it. So uh, uh, a really uh, good default one is like uh, uh, getting mail read rights uh, to an end user um, because that doesn't require uh, uh, administrative consent inside the tenant. It's something that a, a normal low priv user can uh, uh, scope uh, the, uh, the API assignment to. So that's just kind of another uh, famous one as well. So what really makes token theft uh, just extremely deadly is uh, depending uh, on the type of token that you get back. If a user is compromised, they reset their password. In some cases, if the session isn't revoked, then um, we continue to have persistent access to that user. Uh, and then those tokens can be played into uh, other services like Microsoft Office services, like uh, Exchange Online, SharePoint, uh, some of those data rich um, uh, services inside of uh, Microsoft Online. Yeah. And I, I just want to say that I think these two comp uh, combine really well just because. Uh, so with, with a cloud pen test, sometimes uh, if you're relying completely on a password spray, you can hit a dead end there. Now, with social engineering being in scope, it's more realistic. People get fished all the time. Uh, you can do the things such as token theft, which Edwin mentioned. Uh, there's also the direct send spoofing, which is so fantastic for attackers. I've had, I've been able to land messages in in mailboxes directly 
uh, via direct send, uh, and it and you can play with it. I was able to get executables to land attached, uh, but funny enough, it would it would re deny anything with a, with a link in it. It would send to the junk mail, but the executable got through just fine in in this particular instance when I was testing it. Uh, but yeah, if you if you also combine that with uh, the internal access, like let's say you have you you fish somebody successfully, now you have access to their SharePoint in the cloud. You can now host your payloads in SharePoint and turn around and fish again. Uh, so now that it's even coming from a trusted source once you've compromised that first user with a fish. So, I mean, uh, and then, of course, malicious OAuth, uh, if you deploy it as a single tenant app versus a multi-tenant app, then you can do those things such as deploying uh, or accepting the mail read rights for a user and having persistence that way. It's really, this emulates a lot of what you'll see in the real world with attacks. Once, once they get access into uh, one user's account, what are they going to do? Uh, and, and by combining the social engineering and the cloud, you can really hit that well together without doing a, a red team. So the other pairing I wanted to mention quick here is uh, the internal pen test plus the cloud pen test, aka the wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, this is going to be about protecting against malicious insiders or compromised users in your environment. Uh, now in Active Directory, there's a lot of common footholds that still exist in, in internal networks. Uh, so it might be more plausible that somebody is going to get into your cloud environment from internal first. You know, it, externally, if, if you really have your conditional access rules locked down well, and you and you have, uh, you know, a minimal attack surface there, uh, good passwords, MFA, etc. It, it may be unlikely that people are going to be getting in through your cloud environment as the initial entry point. Uh, however, with it still being there, it's still a place that attackers can hide out, they can exfiltrate data through if it's connected, et cetera. There's still attacks that exist there and you shouldn't uh, view it as a complete silo away from your on-premises. Uh, so some example flags here might be, uh, maybe you want us to try to compromise AD or, or a particular host like the AD sync host, uh, and then see what you can do there moving laterally into the, into, uh, or, or privasking through into the uh, cloud environments there. Maybe you want to see if if it's possible to you know infiltrate the AWS or the Azure clouds uh, in particular. Just seeing if if uh, if users from on prem what they can get into on there, uh, and then trying to exfiltrate data. That's something that I think is often overlooked. Is the danger there that uh, if you have on premises users, are you paying attention to that pathway out there that, that you're going to identify uh, when data is being exfilled? Now. Here, I kind of mentioned these here, but yeah, would your organization detect this? Would, would you would you see these movements from and into the cloud from on-prem and, and vice versa? Uh, are, are these things that you have monitoring and detections in place for? I know it's, at least some places definitely do not have it because they had tested only individual components and not considered the movement between those components. So another area here that we can talk about is uh, adversary emulation in the cloud. Uh, and that's just, you know, uh, acting like the attackers do. So we have two main methods of this, assumed breach and assumed access that we're going to be talking about. Now, assumed breach in our vernacular, at least, is when we're referring to uh, a company asset like a laptop that you're given. Uh, sometimes it might be a Citrix session, but that is not ideal to test from usually. Uh, assumed breach is best done yeah, if you're given uh, what remote workers might have, et cetera. That, that's a great perspective. But you can also do like, you know, a detonation uh, of some type of C2 on a box to emulate that. Uh, but really, you're trying to do it from a perspective of a device, really. Uh, the assumed access in our vernacular is where we, we talk about testing with a particular role or a service or as a member of a group. Um, and these are shorter than red teams. Uh, we're not trying to be stealthy, uh, at least not always, uh, maybe at first, uh, especially if there's social engineering uh, parts in there. But uh, let's dive into each of these a little bit and just look at what what is the difference between assumed breach and assumed access. So assumed breach is where we're going to be given credentials of sorts, right? It could be an existing user. Uh, we've we've uh, had, you know, where they've provided a token that they had and using that to jump off of. It could be uh, an old user account that you've re-enabled, or it could be a completely fabricated one too. We've we've done that uh, where they just give us a complete fake persona. It's easier than ever now to generate, you know, fake headshots, et cetera. So, um, that's also a, a way that we've been that we've tested, uh, and then you can the scoping of it doesn't have to be full scope. It can be limited, which is where you just can't kind of keep it to the network and cloud environments, or you can do full scope with social engineering, uh, which of course uh, increases the attack surface and the fun. So, 
uh, this is kind of an overview about what might happen here. Um, Edwin, is there anything you'd want to add in on this one or, or Patrick, uh, I, anything you'd like to comment on, on this particular aspect of testing from an assumed breach scenario? Yeah, from the assumed breach where we get access to a role or, oh, sorry, I was thinking, I was thinking the other one. I apologize. Carry on. <clears throat> no, I, I can at least uh, uh, talk from the uh, uh, assumed breach standpoint. Um, uh, you know, so uh, sometimes uh, uh, customers that are a little bit more advanced in their cloud journey, um, uh, we may not have access externally from the outside. Uh, maybe they have conditional access completely locked down. And so what this scenario is really kind of great for is um, uh, maybe I have a company asset <clears throat> uh, that meets all of their conditional access requirements. And, and one of the good things about this is uh, either from a malicious um, uh, insider perspective or um, uh, just from a, 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 an attacker standpoint, if they manage to gain code execution to the device in question, um, now we have a, a holistic overview of what we can see in the cloud environment. Um, and maybe there's some misconfigurations in there that uh, normal end users have access to that uh, maybe the enterprise uh, uh, that uh, maybe the enterprise doesn't want to have that access uh, granted for like everybody. So um, that's one of uh, I think one of my main key points with with assume breach and what I like about that um, because more than likely we're we're probably dealing with a uh, more advanced uh, cloud environment that has really good security controls. And we would be automatically just shut down from the outside. And I, I think that's probably just one of the main things I just wanted to say about this slide. Yeah, no, that's that's totally. Uh, now, and yeah, full scope uh, obviously uh, needs a little bit more time. It's I, I would still not say this is a red team at all. This is focused on the cloud, but it is just full scope in the sense that anything's on the table as far as uh, attackers uh, tactics go. Um, we're not limiting ourselves to just a one one particular area. But we're not going to take you know a few months trying to be undetected here. Uh, we're trying to get you some results, get some flags knocked out, and some goals uh, identified or you know uh, followed through. Uh, so this is really just trying to be goal oriented, get to different areas, and, and see what you can do here. Now on to the other the other method that we recommend, which is assumed access. This is looking at what would happen, you know, if a particular service was compromised, right? So maybe you have an RCE, uh, you know, the old Apache Struts to uh, what? What if that happened again, or or the log for J, I suppose, uh, and uh, you know, it was it's sitting in in your cloud environment. It, what would happen? It doesn't even have to be something that is your fault, right? You might have set up the perfect cloud environment, uh, but you might have a high risk asset out there that you say, hey, I want to I want to really see what would happen if this asset was compromised. You know, what would they have access to in particular from this vantage point? Uh, and I think that's an important thing to consider sometimes, depending on what you're doing in in the cloud. Uh, but yeah, what would they have access to from there? Because that's the real important thing. If that's your big, uh, you know, the the big target that's going to be attacked or that might be hit. Um, but just, yeah, seeing seeing from that perspective, what's there? Or uh, maybe you have, you know, a, a, a tier of users like the developers, right, where they have mid-level access or they might have access to some resources that are more sensitive. And you say, hey, what would happen if, you know, one of, one of our developers was compromised? What would they have access to there? And because uh, you've identified that as a, a particular area of concern. I, I wanted to mention too, with, with developers and mid-level access, uh, Azure DevOps is a huge, huge target and gold mine for attackers. If they may, if uh, they manage to get into Azure DevOps, because uh, things like storage account keys, uh, personal access tokens, um, uh, you name it, uh, just even down to clear text credentials, uh, depending on uh, what what type of CI CD pipelines that you're running in there, uh, there can be a lot of information that's just running in the clear uh, in terms of DevOps. So I just wanted to mention that too, uh, in terms of uh, developers and the type of access that they have. Yeah, I wanted to include as well for this type of access, it's more of a conversation and a setup process 
because we would identify, work with you to identify which roles are important for your external facing assets or your assets that are part of that build process so that we can identify those and then work in together to be able to make those assumable so we can get access to those roles because that's really the focus. We want to get access to the roles in order to test what they provide access to and not really compromise what those roles are serving. Like we don't have to get access on the ECU2 instances that's hosting Nginx that has access to the IAM role. We just need to work away around well, around what we're actually testing, which is the role access. And that helps us just kind of focus in on that. And we don't have to provide a lot of loopholes or miss or different configuration changes for the client side. That's that's a fantastic point. Thank you. That yeah, so um the the role-based testing is, is very useful. Uh and and it wor working with you to identify that can also be another thing that, that's beneficial is uh so right when you sit down to have that conversation and you because a lot of places might be a little bit uh they may not know really what's out in, in their AWS environment if they don't interact with it on a regular day-to-day uh, -day basis. So uh, working with the developers, people working with that to identify what are the high risk or the higher areas of concern uh, that can be real beneficial also just in identifying what you should be looking out for, uh, you know, beyond just the, doing the assumed access testing for it. So want to walk through some scenarios here, right? Like just, uh, just talking about and testing in general, um, some different scenarios that are helpful to look at, right? Or that may be helpful to look at. So the first one is just the compromised standard user, right? What happens if any normal quote unquote user gets compromised? Uh, what could be done there? Where are your detections at? Are you going to see this happening? Or are you going to notice anything anomalous at all? Or would this just go on without you seeing it happening? Uh, so, I mean, there's a few different areas where you can use uh, assumed breach or assumed access to 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 impersonate this to normal user to see uh, what would happen if a bad actor got onto your, your environment uh, with some valid creds uh, and you had not detected the initial entry. So, Oftentimes we'll find, you know, SharePoint has been huge uh, as far as finding secrets that are not properly stored, and that can really lead to some uh, privilege escalation. But there's there's a variety of things, and uh, this this can help you see why it's important to check some of those boxes in that config review, right? Like not allowing users to register their own applications. This becomes apparent when you are when a user has deployed a malicious app and they're phishing other users. You see, oh, this is why we turn this off. Uh, so I mean. That it, it's a good validation that you have the correct uh, configuration in place, but it's also good to drive home the point that this this is why these are bad things because attackers actually use these. Uh, compromised user account with token theft. Edwin spoke on this a bit here already. Um, emulating you know real world attackers who compromise an account, uh, kind of peeling back that outer layer maybe of of having to perform the actual fish even if you're doing an assumed uh, breach there. Uh, where you're just given some some tokens to use uh, because you know over the long term we, we're testing in a week or maybe two weeks but a real world attacker they could send fishes all year long so i mean at the end of the day this lets you peel back that first layer and test what would happen if this if this were to occur which is you know it's a non-zero possibility so and then uh the last one here is going to be compromise of it like a developer ssh key this is one one that we've tested in the past uh and it's it's good to show what would happen, you know, if if maybe maybe you're not following some great practices and multiple people have the same SSH key, for instance, uh, in a shared jump box or something like that. What would happen there? What could be done? Um, you know, could could you uh, sabotage some things on the box that would affect other users on the box? That type of thing. What can you reach and as far as the cloud goes? Um, but really looking at from from this role, uh, what what could be done here? So that's. That's an overview of some of the, the more advanced areas of testing that what, what you can do beyond that first round. So let's let's take a quick review here. I know we're coming up on time. So uh, let's take a quick review and see kind of where everything fits into place here. Um, we have a config review. We have a cloud pen test. And then we have these advanced scenarios that we mentioned here. Now, one big question that often comes up that I want to touch on while we, we have you here uh, is what do you do? Do you do the config review or the pen test? Which one should I do right now? And the answer to that is it depends. It, it really depends because uh, it depends on what you've done lately. It depends on your goals here. Well, uh, the biggest thing I would say is that 
if if you want to see what your security is right now, time and place at this moment, do a pen test, right? If you're concerned about something, let's say uh, there, there's a new acquisition that you have where you, you acquired this company, you don't know what shape they're in. A configure review would be great, but it's not going to show you what people might be attacking or using already, where they might have already snuck in. So a cloud pen test in that case will help you identify those actionable attacks, where they might have gotten in, things that are exposed, but the real attack surfaces that's out there. Um, or you might do it after you make it in a change to your environment. You want, you want you want another cloud pen test then to make sure that the new services and those controls for those services are working as you thought they are. It's a validation of the configuration. Now, the configure review, I think you should do, first of all, anytime you go into the cloud, uh, once you have your, your majority of stuff in there, do a configure review, set up the baseline, get, get your castle walls, so to speak, into place. Uh, make sure your castle has a moat and has bars on the windows, et cetera. Um, all those things that a castle should have, uh, make sure that you're doing that, right? And then uh, also, if you if you have an existing cloud environment and you haven't performed one yet, do one, do one immediately because this is going to give you your baseline security and let you know where you are. You'll get scored on it. You'll see where you need to improve. It will be a comprehensive list, but it'll at least be a comprehensive list <laughs> um, of what you need to do. So, I mean, and, and it is is prioritized too. So it's not like it should be completely overwhelming, but the, the cloud pen test will show you actionable attacks right now. The configure review will show you what you should improve on overall. So I, uh, hopefully that kind of gives you some ideas as far as which one to do when. Um, and we're always happy to talk to you about it. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time. I'd, I'm happy to give my opinion on which would be best at any particular uh, scenario there. Uh, now, and again, just to mention the benefits of advanced testing. So once you've done that good testing, the configure views, the pen tests, and you're doing a good job there, um, or if you're just really concerned about your security and you want to see holistically where, where things are, but you don't really want to do a four-month or three-month red team or anything like that, um, we can expand the scope and just look at multiple components together and see what you can do there, see what gaps you have, see what weak points that there might be or lateral movement uh, paths. Uh, but really just trying to look at it more big picture, seeing what the attackers see and doing what the attackers do, uh, because that's what's going to bite you at the end of the day. So with that, uh, are there any questions? We'd be happy to jump in there. I'm going to go off video and have a drink of water, uh, but I'll be here. We'll be answering questions. Uh, just one moment. All right, let's look at our chat and see if we have any questions here. Now, here it is, Q&A. So let's look through here. We'll find some and we'll answer them here now. All right, uh, do some easy ones here. How uh, Somebody asked, how long does a cloud pen test typically last? Now, it depends. That's a very good question. Um, and it's something that is not exactly straightforward all the time because one organization can have vastly different cloud presence than another organization, right? And so it's not just how many things you have in the cloud, how many resources, but what types of resources, because some resources have almost no attack surface, virtually no attack surface. Uh, some of them have a big attack surface, and the way that you uh, investigate those is different too. So it's unfortunately not a super concise answer there. What we do is we can scope it two ways, uh, or that this is at least how we approach it, right? We can scope it two ways, but we'll take a look at the overall number of accounts uh, in, in the environment and we'll use that to kind of gauge, okay, how many how many buckets per se do we have to go into and look in? Because each account often is, is you know, uh, going to be kind of like its own bucket that you have to dive into. Now, we, we take that and we also take into account, you know, the number of resources overall, uh, ideally, we have a thing that we uh, call our scoping scripts. It's really just like an inventory and it pulls out a list and we can use that to better gauge. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we can always do time box, you know, just like any pen test in the past. You can always say, OK, here's my priority. Here are the things I'm concerned about. I want to focus on these and I want to focus on the low hanging fruit, the things the attackers are going to use to get in. And so, you know, it's something that obviously you can work with um, at the end of the day. Uh, it, it, it's oftentimes between a week or two weeks is often what we what we uh, can get down to, whether it's a matter of reducing scope a little bit into, you know, uh, the very important environments or uh, or just doing time box and, and saying we'll get everything we can within this time box. Uh, and we obviously, like any pen test, prioritize the, the high 
the high yield, high potential damage uh, areas first. So, all right, let's go down, uh, move down the list. Let's see. No, Edwin or Patrick, if you see any in here that you want to point out, please do. Uh, apologize, I'll just be moving through here a little bit slowly, finding some. All right. Uh, here, okay. Here, here's a good one. Uh, is Duo a good solution for access to O365 Azure if using push? If not, why? Edwin, do you want to talk about push and O365 and Azure? Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, I think the last time I, I encountered uh, Duo that was configured in, in this nature, um, I was able to uh, uh, end up compromising the end user. Uh, so, so typically, um, uh, uh, normal foothold, weak password sprain, see that it's backed with MFA. Um, I will not attempt to log in as that user um, immediately. Uh, generally, what I'll do is I'll do some additional reconnaissance like on LinkedIn to see geographically where they are located. Um, and then um, the next morning, I'll, I'll just grab a cup of coffee. Uh, I'll log in as the end user at 8 a.m. in the morning. And um, I'll continually just bombard the user uh, with push notifications until they accept. Um, so it really kind of depends on what's going on in Duo. Uh, it's been a while since I've encountered uh, a Duo customer. Um, but if they're simply just uh, relying on just push requests, uh, generally, uh, you know, three, four, five times, and then somebody may get annoyed, and they'll then they'll just hit accept, and and then it's kind of done and over with. That that's been that's been my experience. Um, I don't know if anything has changed in Duo where they do uh, something like Authenticator does, where they have to do uh, some type of uh, uh, number matching, uh, or if they get like geographic details uh, of where the logon request is kind of coming from. Um, but uh, going back to just push notifications real quick. Uh, so when Microsoft Authenticator came out and push notifications was the default in that, uh, the success was a lot higher than normal if we were able to get a uh, weak password. Um, but now with things like number matching, uh, that does a lot of disruption in those types of attacks where then we have to look at uh, gaps in like conditional access to see if... Um, to see if MFA isn't covered uh, on a on a different endpoint, such as like Microsoft Graph. So, uh, um, I don't want to say Duo is a bad solution, uh, not by any stretch of the means. Uh, I think it's just going to come down to the way that you have it configured. And I, I would just suggest that if you are a Duo customer, and they do have like configuration options like number matching or the um, or even down to like one time passwords. Uh, that's going to be way better than uh, push notification requests uh, received by the end user. Perfect. Thank you. So here's another interesting one that I, I noticed. Uh, so, okay. My question focuses on the use of dual use tools, such as Screen Connect, AnyDesk, or FileZilla. These tools have been increasingly utilized in living off the land attacks, such as lateral movement, data exfil, and persistence. Seems that they're the first choice for attackers getting initial access uh, of attackers for getting initial access. And then given the cloud-based nature of these tools and recent security incidents, how do you plan to mitigate the threats posed by such dual-use tools? This is, a, this is an interesting question. I don't have a great answer for you, I will say. Uh, I have an answer. Uh, I don't know. Um, so one of the things that I noticed at, at, a, at a very secure company that I had pen tested uh, a while back is that they had a list of products that they would not use because they were either used commonly for attacks or they were commonly hacked um, or the target of hacks, I should say. Uh, you know, for RCE, et cetera. So um, what you end up finding then is in those environments, uh, a lot of those tools are, are missing. I mean, they're just, uh, you know, I'm not going to find, uh, you know, uh, script console accessible, or I'm not going to find uh, uh, various ex uh, Microsoft products that are out there um, because they, they were uh, on, on a banned list, um, just things that had bad security histories that were on their banned list. And I know, realize not everybody's going to be able to do this. This was a shop that used uh, uh, LDAP and uh, Google and all. It was not a Microsoft shop, but, um, and so it may be easier in some instances to get away from some of these tools. I obviously, the ones you mentioned are not Microsoft tools per se. Uh, at least I do not believe that Screen Connect is. But at any rate, I, I know it's not a great answer, but I, I would say that like really, uh, 
trying to limit access to, to these tools, either uh, if they're cloud-based, they're cloud endpoints. Um, but uh, seeing companies have a policy against using particular tools has, has been effective, at least in, in my view, in the past. I don't know if uh, Patrick or Edwin have anything else you'd like to contribute to this. And it's kind of a, a neat question, though. I wanted to address it. Yeah, I've certainly seen similar on some engagements as well with customers that provide their own kind of in-house BDI or ship a laptop to us or something, and they have things locked down and certain tools are not available or OS tools. And we kind of have to make our own ways to kind of get around those, which is definitely a thing. So. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's look here. I was looking at another one oh. for uh, that someone asked, if we see this access, where do you typically ask to get placed? For example, do you need to be in a heavy heavy workload VPC or simply having access anywhere in the network or suffice. Um, typically, at least for the AWS side of uh, engagements, we ask that um, if we have network access that's being provided either by like an internal tap or a tap that's connected to on-prem, we ask that it have access to the EC2 instances and subnets that are in scope. That's because if we do find credentials in plain text, either in metadata or in files or somewhere else, that might be LDAP that would allow us to connect to the LDAP system um, that's running an EC2, then we would like to be able to continue that attack path and see where it can go. Um, so our typical advice is just within the network um, where the typical workload are kind of similar to the role-based attack that we're talking about in the advanced scenario. Because if one of those were to become popped and compromised, then that's where the attacker will be pivoting from. So that we're sort of emulating that network access in a way. Excellent. Uh, let's see here. Ooh, are you using any specific tools for crawling SharePoint for creds and other goodies? Well, there is a terrific tool that came out recently at, at DEF CON. Uh, Edwin, would you want to speak to that at all? Um, uh, so hang on here. So, okay. so crawling SharePoint. Is that yep, the question? Sorry to put you on the spot there. No, so no, 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 no. Graphrunner is fantastic. Gra gra uh, Graphrunner is uh, kind of one of the main ones. Um, prior to that, um, I, I think a lot of people were just going in through the GUI route and just doing uh, simple search terms and, and pass phrases. Uh, Graphrunner definitely speeds up the uh, automation of scouring out uh, uh, SharePoint online. So there, there's a, a couple, uh, there's some example commands uh, where you can pillage services, stuff like that. Uh, there's also a, a JSON file in there too uh, that can run some default detections and, and pump out more goodies for you. Um, but uh, the, that's, that's probably one of the bigger ones to uh, 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 search out uh, SharePoint online is GraphRunner. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so another question here for an assumed breach, you said that it's device focused. I'm curious if that means you aren't generally dropping tools on the machine and focusing on what the device has access to alone, or if you are still dropping tools on the machine. So I, I would say that that depends. Um, if they're shipping us the laptop, then generally no need to put tools on there, but assume breach can be done either. Yeah. Remotely with a C2 implant on there, or it can be uh, done in, in person with a, with an actual laptop there. Um, sometimes it's still beneficial to have a C2 on your laptop. Uh, if, if you're trying to, uh, you know, push some things through there, it might be easier, uh, to do some forwarding from the C2 agent, uh, in, into the environment versus, uh, you know, uh, just doing it directly from on there. So there, there's, there's opportunity for both. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get through all these here. Uh, okay. So. Okay, here, uh, this this one is for Edwin here. Uh, so if a, if a company is in Azure, but hybrid, and right back to main office AD is read only, is that good? Or should the firm attempt to move all AD components to Azure and get away from on-premise or hybrid? Do you have an opinion on that one, Edwin? It is this um, down from the top if you're looking for the... It, it, yeah, it, no, I see it. So uh, that that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, because uh, I, I think for some enterprises, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to get off of uh, Active Directory. Um, I, I don't think write back is necessarily a, a bad thing doing password write back, um, but it, I think it's going to come down to more of like your security controls that you have in place. If you have a well-developed like MFA program uh, that uh, that your users are on, um, 
One thing I did want to mention with MFA, like uh, there are things like pass keys that are coming out for the Microsoft Authenticator app that's going to make that uh, phishing resistant. So uh, there, there's, there's things that you can do to secure not only your people, but your devices. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody, hey, you need to move off AD to, to be more secure. Um, I, I think the general observation is that uh, when the cloud came out and Active Directory uh, had its own problems and quirks and enterprises were still dealing with that, uh, then they decided to uh, go ahead and, and throw cloud in the mix. And that's just kind of the, the boat that I think that some people are in right now. Um, but I, I would just say from, uh, from at least from a security standpoint, look at your conditional access policy sets and, and see what you're doing to actually secure your devices and your people. Um, because if you're securing devices such as like device compliance, uh, uh, utilizing Entra ID join where uh, the device actually has to live inside your Active Directory environment, that's that does stop some external attacks uh, really cold, so. Nice. Um, the, here's another one that uh, we can answer a few uh... So some people are asking about either a course or some training uh, that would be beneficial if you're trying to move into OffSec uh, in the cloud. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, so for instance, uh, what would be the best path for a cloud solution architect to move towards cloud security and pen testing? Um, so do you, uh, Patrick or Edwin, do you have any suggestions on either certs or, uh, you know, hack the box that tile, style thing, CTFs? Uh, or what, what have you found were, was the best thing for you as far as getting into cloud? Um, for, for Azure, um, the, the typical system administrator stuff, uh, uh, Microsoft Learn is a really good resource. Um, they have some uh, hybrid courses. Uh, uh, and then uh, some of the more advanced courses like Azure Security Engineering, that type of stuff, that will give you more of a uh, advanced foundational approach on how some Azure workloads work. Um, but I, I guess my main suggestion would be is to understand and learn how uh, hybrid works, how users and devices get synced from on-prem to the cloud. Um, but I would say if you're just starting out, Microsoft Learn is probably going to be uh, your best bet to to uh, to get that foundational knowledge. Perfect. And uh, Patrick, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, now you're good. I was going to say for the AWS side, uh, going the documentation there is going to help a bunch as well for the specifics of how all the services work. But there are some other solutions for like just generalized training. So like uh, Actrix uh, website, Hacking the Cloud, Hack the Box has various ones, including an AWS Fortress. And I know uh, the other one name of the other one, just Try Hack Me also has AWS stuff. So there's various lab environments and general for uh, content that you can look for online. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Uh, so we do have to wrap up here real soon. I'm just kind of trying to see if there's anything else we can answer really quick here. Um, there, there's a little bit of a difficult one. If if there's anybody who has a question here that didn't get answered, feel free to email me after this. Uh, it, my email address is first.last at trustedsec.com. So uh, go ahead and send me an email if you have any questions here that we were not able to answer here. Um, and I'd be happy to happy to talk to you more about any of this. Uh, are we still using C2 from time to time in your engagements? There's mostly token manipulation related. Um, I would say it, it it depends. It depends on what the goals are for it. Sorry, that's not a great answer. Uh, let's anything else that we can do real easy. Um, if you are looking to do just a quick look at your at your setup, uh, Scout Suite in Azure is a great tool uh, for just taking a quick glance and seeing what things are what things are like. Um, uh, Patrick, what was your do you have a recommendation for AWS for uh, the quick quick peek? Yeah, quick peek, Scott's is going to provide a lot of good there. If you're really worried about IAM capabilities, you can look at PMapper. That'll do a whole graph mapping of it. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, I think we have to wrap it up there. But thank you all for attending today. It was really nice to have the opportunity to talk to you about this. And uh, hopefully you take a look at your cloud pen testing and, and see where you can maybe expand it a little bit. So thanks so much for your time and have a great day.